Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. It was a day of high drama, multiple calls for the Prime Minister's resignation. Many more questions about exactly which events the PM attended. A party leader being chucked out of the Commons and a joke about Jimmy Savile from the man leading the country. As Boris Johnson faces the prospect of being questioned by police, we'll get reaction on today's show from the Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, the Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davey, and the SNP Westminster leader, Ian Blackford. Plus, the former shadow Foreign Secretary Jack Straw, who knows only too well what it's like to live through a PM being questioned by the police. It's Tuesday, the 1st of February. The jury is still out. Senior Conservatives round on the PM after Sue Gray pinpointed failures of leadership in Downing Street. Police probe 12 lockdown gatherings and 300 photos as officers prepare to contact those who attend, which could mean speaking to the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I get it and I will fix it. The jury's still out because we haven't come to the end of this process. The Prime Minister heads to Ukraine today, but does he leave his troubles behind him? He spoke to Tory MPs last night to try and head off a leadership challenge. I'm live at Scotland Yard to analyse exactly what the Met Police will be investigating. The PM heads to Kiev to try to solve the crisis in Ukraine after a phone call with Russia's President Putin was cancelled in the wake of Sue Gray. You're very welcome to join us wherever you're watching us around the world this morning, whether it's in Iceland or Africa. Word up why there's a new lease of life for the hit game Wordle. How easy do you find it? Depends really on the day, doesn't it? Oh, we start with a jiu. And the skylines of four Chinese cities have been lit to mark the Lunar New Year and the beginning of the Winter Olympics. Good morning, everybody. The Prime Minister will attempt to put the dramatic events of yesterday behind him as he heads to Ukraine today to try to stop a Russian attack. But has he stopped an attack on his own leadership? He faces being questioned by police after Sue Gray released parts of her report into lockdown party allegations, which pinpointed failures of leadership. Senior Conservatives say the jury is still out on his future after multiple calls for the Prime Minister's resignation, but he met backbenchers last night in an attempt to shore up support for his own position. The Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, and Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, on the show this hour. First, let's remind you of some of the key points that you are waking up to today. They look a little bit like this. Police are investigating 12 of the 16 alleged gatherings Sue Gray is looking at. The Prime Minister reportedly attended at least three of those events, but was he at a fourth as well? It's reported the PM's wife, Carrie, held a party on the 13th of November in the Downing Street flat after Dominic Cummings left Downing Street. This is the one of the events the Met is looking into. The Metropolitan Police says officers will be uh, contacting those who attended the events to hear their accounts. That could even mean the Prime Minister being questioned face to face. Officers have received more than 300 images from the Cabinet Office to review. They've also been sent more than 500 pages of information. Top civil servant Sue Gray's report concluded that there were failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of Number 10 and the Cabinet Office. Here's John Craig. A late night return to 10 Downing Street for Boris Johnson after a bruising day in the Commons when he was accused of failures of leadership in Sue Gray's scathing report. And as the Prime Minister embarks on a trip to Ukraine today, the Metropolitan Police is now investigating 12 alleged parties with the aid of 300 photos. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In the Commons, Mr Johnson Speaker, said sorry. Mr Speaker, I get it and I will fix it. But the PM faced anger from his predecessor. What the Gray report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules, or didn't understand what they meant and others around him, or they didn't think the rules applied to Number 10. Which was it? After two hours in the Commons and then an hour behind closed doors with Tory MPs, the PM is being warned the Partygate row is far from over. 
The truth is that the jury's still out because we haven't come to the end of this process. What I will say is that I saw signs there, important signs of an acknowledgement that more needs to be done and an acknowledgement that he had to comply with the recommendations made in Sue Gray's report. The people that couldn't say goodbye to a loved one, that's going to stay with them for the rest of their life and I need to reach a conclusion that I can explain to them. So I want to see all of the facts before I reach my decision. After Sue Gray's damning verdict, the PM's leadership is under threat once again. But he's defiantly rejecting calls to quit. John Craig, Sky News. We sent Tamara down to Downing Street as well. She is joining us now. Um, um, Katie, as you, as, well, as you can see, is at New Scotland Yard for us this morning. Ladies, good morning, good morning. Let's go to Downing Street first of all, um, should we? Uh, PM was in the Commons yesterday, but he's heading out of the country today, tomorrow. That's right, and the question is, does he leave his troubles behind him? The problem with the Sue Gray report is it doesn't really draw a line under anything. The Prime Minister's critics, who were hoping for a stick of political dynamite that would blow up his premiership, didn't get that because Sue Gray couldn't tell us many of the details. She was so severely limited, as she put it, by the fact that the police investigation is going on. But on the other hand, his allies, who wanted to say, look, there's nothing much to see here, couldn't really say that either because we've got 12 of these gatherings investigated by the police, including at least three that the Prime Minister was at himself. That is the infamous birthday party with the cake, the gathering back in May 2020, the bring your own booze one that there was an email to staff about, and uh, one actually not in Downing Street office, but upstairs in the Downing Street flat where the Prime Minister lives with his family that happened on the 13th of November of that year when Dominic Cummings left and it's alleged that there was a victory party in which the ABBA song, The Winner Takes It All, was playing out. They are among those that are being investigated. So there's no world in which the Prime Minister is not wounded and damaged by this. But talking to Tory MPs last night, Kay, he met Tory MPs to try and shore up their support after some angry exchanges in the Commons. The sense I got is that he fights on for now, possibly not for that long if the police investigation comes back and says that he broke the law or any damaging photos emerge, but certainly the sense of an immediate leadership challenge seems to have been headed off, but he's been told that he's on notice and he's expected to make big changes to the way his operation runs. OK, tomorrow, thank you. Casey, um, what is it exactly that the police are investigating and how long is it going to take? Well, good morning, Kay. I mean, really, the first thing the police say they are going to do is go through this enormous kind of evidence dump they say they have now uh, received in relation to these alleged parties. 500 pages of evidence they say they have received, things like WhatsApp messages, as well as 300 photographs. We have been hearing uh, rumours for a couple of weeks now that there are photographs uh, of these gatherings. I don't think anybody uh, realised it was going to be quite uh, this much. Of course, the Met have come under criticism for saying initially they didn't have the evidence to investigate. That has now, they say, changed. Commander Catherine Roper said last night uh, they only received this evidence on Friday. We had a, a bundle of material provided to us just Friday, um, which is well over 500 of uh, pieces of paper, about a ream and a half uh, we received, and uh, over 300 photographs. What they will do after that, they say, is use that evidence that they are analysing uh, to decide who they need to contact to speak to further uh, about these gatherings. They say, as part of the investigation, it is necessary for us to contact those who attended to get their account. Now, it's understood initially uh, that will be by email. People will be sent questionnaires to fill out, but the Met have not, at this stage, ruled out uh, in-person interviews. Now, we know that Tony Blair, as a sitting Prime Minister, was interviewed as a witness. It is a big if, but if Boris Johnson was to be interviewed in person uh, under caution by the Met Police in relation to these parties, he would be the first sitting Prime Minister to have done so. Now, of course, as Tamara said, the Met are investigating 12 alleged gatherings that took place across eight different dates. The one that really is going to be potentially a big problem for the Prime Minister is that November the 13th, 2020 gathering. The Met say they are investigating and 
alleged gathering in Boris Johnson's private flat. Very hard uh, to explain away uh, in terms of a work event uh, or anything like that. The Met Police have said, though, this investigation is going to take weeks, not months, so we could be expecting some conclusions from them fairly soon. OK, ladies, for now, thank you both. Uh, let's take a more detailed look at some of the events in Downing Street for you now, should we? Look something like this. 16 events fell within Sue Gray's investigations remit, 12 of which are now being investigated by the Metropolitan Police. Looking at four of them in particular, 20th of May 2020, during the first national lockdown, Boris Johnson's principal private secretary, Martin Reynolds, reportedly invited more than 100 staff to an event in the Downing Street Garden. Staff were told to make the most of the lovely weather and bring their own drinks. On the 16th of April last year, 30 Downing Street staff reportedly drank alcohol in the early hours at uh, two separate events. One of them was a leaving do for the Prime Minister's former Director of Communications, James Slack, who later apologised. An, an attendee was reportedly sent shopping with a suitcase to fill with bottles of wine. The events took place the night before the Queen was forced to sit by herself at Prince Philip's COVID-restricted funeral. Meanwhile, the most recent event to come to light was on the Prime Minister's birthday on the 19th of June of 2020. Downing Street admitted staff gathered briefly inside number 10, the cabinet room, saying Boris Johnson had been there for less than 10 minutes. Up to 30 people are thought to have attended the event, where Boris Johnson is said to have been presented with a cake while the staff sang happy birthday. Yesterday, the Prime Minister faced the full backlash from those events in the Commons as the PM had to contend with heavy criticism from across the House. What the Grey report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules, or didn't understand what they meant, and others around him, or they didn't think the rules applied to Number 10. Which was it? I have to tell him he no longer enjoys my support. The public know this is a man they can no longer trust. He has been investigated by the police. He misled the House. He must now resign. I drove for three hours from Staffordshire to Kent. Only ten people at the funeral. Many people who loved her had to watch online. I didn't hug my siblings. I didn't hug my parents. I gave a eulogy. And then afterwards, I didn't even go to her house for a cup of tea. I drove back three hours from Kent to Staffordshire. Does the Prime Minister think I'm a fool? Goodness. Still to come on the programme for you, failures of leadership and judgment in Downing Street. Uh, we'll be speaking to the um, Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, about the latest on the party's investigation. Also speaking, engaging reaction to that long-awaited report from the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer. He's joining us at 10 to 8. The SNP's leader in Westminster, Ian Blackford, will be joining me later this morning to give his verdict on yesterday's events in the Commons. And at 9am next Monday, the 7th of Feb, the Education Secretary, Nadeem Zahawi, will be here to answer all of your questions. You can send them to us via Twitter or email your questions if you'd like to, or send us a video clip. Uh, you can email us at, at asktheeducationsecretary at sky.uk. Boris Johnson will travel to Kiev today to hold talks with the Ukrainian president about the rising tensions on the country's border with Russia. Let's find out more about it, should we? Both the PM and the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss were due to travel to Kiev today, but having tested positive for COVID yesterday after appearing in the House of Commons, Ms Truss will no longer make the journey. Meanwhile, at a meeting of the United Nations Security Council, there were angry exchanges between the US and Russia. Russia has assembled a massive military force of more than 100,000 troops along, the Ukraine's, along Ukraine's border. These are combat forces and special forces prepared to conduct offensive actions into Ukraine. You are almost calling for this as if you want to make your words become a reality. Where did you get the figure of 100,000 troops? We have never cited that figure. We've never confirmed that figure. Let's get more with our defence and security editor, Deborah Haynes, standing by for us. Hi, Deborah. A very good morning um, to you. We, our Prime Minister is heading out to uh, Kiev today to try to um, sort this out as far as he is concerned. Where are we? 
Yes, this is supposed to be a really big moment for Boris Johnson in terms of his personal involvement in a crisis that is being described as one of the gravest security crises for Europe since the end of the Cold War. And yet he hasn't got off to a great start. He was supposed to have a phone call with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin yesterday. But given all that, that he had to do in responding to the Sue Gray um, update, he had to delay that call. So that was supposed to sort of be ahead of this great big meeting today in Kiev. But he still, and he, and he was supposed to be going to his foreign, with his foreign secretary, who, like you said, unfortunately has tested positive for COVID, so is staying back at home. However, it has to be said that the UK has has so far played a, a leading role in the Ukraine response. So I'm sure he'll get a warm welcome. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed, Deborah. Thank you. Looking at some of today's other headlines for you now, the main suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann has said it would have been absurd for him to have abducted her because it would have risked his activities as a drug dealer. Christian B, who is serving a seven-year sentence for rape, told a German documentary he wasn't caught for drug dealing because he was careful. Writing from prison, he said, I was never caught by the police because I followed, he's in prison, remember, followed a few key principles. Abducting someone was just as absurd to me at that time as starting a nuclear war or slaughtering a chicken. The Department of Health is warning that measles vaccinations rates have dropped to their lowest level in a decade. More than one in ten children in England still haven't had both doses by the time they start school, putting them at risk of the potentially fatal disease. And the judge in the sexual assault case against Prince Andrew has made a formal request for his former assistant to give evidence. Lawyers for Virginia Dufre had requested assistance to obtain the testimony. She accuses the prince of sexually assaulting her when she was 17. He denies all the allegations. Deputy PM's with us. Uh, so much to talk to you about. Good morning. You got the morning, straw this morning, didn't you? Um, the PM said yesterday he gets it and he will fix it. What does that actually mean? Well, the Sue Gray report has been published in full, as he undertook to do. It set out a series of points which, uh, with contrition and uh, further apology, uh, the Prime Minister fully accepted. He's talking about, in particular, what we're going to do to uh, correct and remedy some of the problems Sue Gray highlighted. He's going to set up an office of the Prime Minister uh, in Downing Street. If you look at the history of Number 10 over successive uh, governments and years, uh, the combination of it being uh, the nerve centre of the whole of government, as well as the Prime Minister's office, has, if you like, blurred or at least left unclarified key lines of, of responsibility. So he's correcting that with the new Permanent Secretary. He's reviewing the, the Code of Conduct for civil servants, but also for special advisers. That will look not just at are there any gaps that the Grey Report highlights, but how it's enforced in practice. Um, and more broadly, looking at how uh, Number 10 and uh, Cabinet uh, function, how it reports to Parliament. I think it's a comprehensive set of proposals. Okay. And at the same time, he's getting on with the job okay. uh, with the vaccine rollout, the economy, and, of course, okay. dealing with Ukraine, as you've already said. Are you content to sit there and say that uh, he's published the full report? Well, he's published the full report he's been given. Well, that's a completely different Deputy Prime Minister, as we both know. Well, forgive me, but he's in the hands of Sue Gray. She's provided this report. Will he publish the full She's... report once the police have finished? Yes, the if there's any subsequent findings Fine. from Sue Gray. Okay. And he was clear about that today. OK. I just want to remind you and our viewers, we never get tired of looking at this clip from the 8th of December. I can understand how infuriating it must be to think that the people who have been setting the rules have not been following the rules, Mr Speaker, because I was also furious to see that clip. I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that, and that no Covid rules were broken. First he didn't know. Then it was a work event, then no one told him it was a party, then he was ambushed by a cake, then we had to wait for Sue Gray, now we have to wait for the full report. What next? Well, look, he's waited for Sue Gray because, as an independent investigation, that's the right thing to do. In relation to, I think there are 12 incidents which relate to specific 
uh, alleged or claimed breaches, it's right that Sue Gray has said that's for the police to look at. These are things out of our control, but if you're going to have a... Prime Minister was at allegedly at least three of those. But, well, again, allegedly. But, look, if you're going to have... How an many parties do you, but, do you think he was at? But look, I, I think the point here... How many parties did he the Cabinet okay, that he was okay, at? OK, I'll say every question you've got. I always do. But, look, the, the point is, uh, if there are any claims that need to go to the police, and Sue Gray has referred... 12, that's fine. But they need to be looked at independently. And you can't then blame the Prime Minister or the government for not rushing the police to do their job. We'd be in a whole world of other criticism if we did that. They have the time and the space. No one wants that uh, investigation to collude more swiftly than us. Um, but it must be done on their terms. But Deputy Prime Minister, he told us there were no parties. Then he, as I said, I went through the whole list. I don't need to go through it again. And yeah. now the police are investigating 12 events. Well, I think it's right. If there's any question marks and there's been a whole there range are, of... of course. Well, and there's been a whole range of claims to ascertain the facts, to ascertain the facts as to whether uh, anything uh, that breached the law has taken place, it's right that the police do that. But they need the time and the space to, to do so. And in any event, uh, the government, let alone the Prime Minister, can't control what the police do. That okay. wouldn't be right. OK, well, let, let me put this to you that Jess Phillips said yesterday in the House. Was the Prime Minister present at the event in his flat on the 13th of November. I assume he doesn't need other people to tell him whether he was there or not. Um, was he at the flat event listed in the report on the 13th of November? He doesn't need the police to tell him that. Well, he doesn't need the police to tell him that, but if he does start answering specific questions that have been referred to the police, he will be accused in fact, fairly and rightly, of prejudicing or preempting or interfering in that investigation, which is why... It's just uh, fixed penalty notices. Well, there's still the law. Look, you can't have it both ways, Kay. You can't say, on the one hand, the, uh, the sanctions are not very high, and on the other hand, it's a very serious issue. Okay. We take it very seriously. In Those which case, incidents have gone to the police. In which case... They need to be allowed the time to investigate. In which case... It's very serious, as you said, in your own words, so he should step down if he's found guilty of any of those offences. And let's wait and see what the... You just said it was... You can't have it both ways well, as well, I, Deputy I, I'm, Prime Minister. I'm not. I'm having it one way, which, which is, is allow the police to conduct their investigation and see when they've ascertained the facts quite what uh, they conclude. And, of okay. course, there'll be full transparency around that. And, look, I get your frustration, the public's frustration. No one is not more mine. frustrated... I'm, I'm asking these questions well, on behalf of no, the no, public this No, no, I think it's fair. Morning. And I think the public... But I think we want this done uh, and dusted as soon as possible as okay, well. OK, well, this is what the former Prime Minister said. What the Grey report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules or didn't understand what they meant and others around him or they didn't think the rules applied to number 10. Which was it? I don't think actually that's quite right in terms of what the Sue Gray report did. It said that they hadn't lived up to the standards that would have been expected. But in relation to specific breaches, Sue it's Gray... A failure of leadership, actually, is what yes, it said. Yes, well, which is not quite what um, uh, Theresa said. But in relation to the 12 specific instances where there are alleged breaches, those have gone to the police, and it's quite right to wait for them to conduct that investigation. Did you believe in the lockdown that you and your colleagues championed? Yes, I did. And Do I, you think the and Prime I thought Minister it was. Did? Yeah, absolutely. So why are the police investigating 12 separate incidents that took part in Downing Street? Because if there's any, precisely because... That's it's... a lot, though, isn't it? Sorry, let me answer the question. Precisely because it's important, precisely because I get the argument about double standards. Where there have been uh, allegations, claims, assertions that rules have been broken, it is absolutely right that, first of all, it was referred to Sue Gray, and Sue Gray is now, if there's any potential breach of the law, referred it to the police, and they should look at it. And uh, we've been very clear there'll be transparency and accountability that will follow that, just as there has been with Sue Gray's report. I know you said that uh, he's got the support of MPs. Let's listen to this. When he kindly invited me to see him ten days ago, I told him that I thought he should think very carefully about what was now in the best interests of our country and of the Conservative Party. And I have to tell him he no longer enjoys my support. Aaron Bell also said he recounted the experience of ten people attending his grandmother's funeral. Does the Prime Minister think I'm a fool, is what he said. Um, he's losing the house. Well, OK, I think, actually, if you um, listen to the 
whole of the two hours the PM spent in the chamber. Yes, there were, you've picked out the, the two uh, most strident critics from the Conservative side, I think it's fair to say, but actually... Four, I've, I've given you nine. Well, uh, Three uh, Tories and, and a Labour politician. OK, but you've given... Uh, but actually, it was over you know, 650 MPs in the House of Commons. My, my feeling was that the PM, uh, the combination of contrition, uh, answering the Sue Gray uh, challenge in terms of the problems and how he's going to fix it, but also saying how he's getting on with the job, the vaccine rollout, the economy, uh, and also dealing with the situation in Ukraine. And that is overwhelmingly what MPs, and I think our voters and our constituents, want to see him doing and this government doing. And, and actually, the, the, in the meeting of the parliamentary party, uh, which I attended with the PM and the whole party was there, he, of course, there were questions, you'd expect that, but actually people wanted to see this Prime Minister getting back on with the job uh, and recognise the job that he's done uh, on the vaccine rollout, on the economic recovery, uh, okay. but also the foreign policy issues that he's dealing with we'll out in those. Ukraine. We'll come to those. Uh, this is what the Met Police have been saying. Uh, they're investigating eight um, of 12 dates, uh, 12 events, considering by Cabinet Office alleged gatherings on government premises during COVID restrictions, received 300-plus images, 500-plus pages, of information reviewing materials shall confirm which individuals will need to be contacted for their independent account. Um, who takes 300 images at work events? That's a good question. Um, but I don't want to get drawn into uh, the animus of those who have put this out there because actually I think what the public would say is that um, uh, those are credible um, claims that at least need to be investigated and that's why the police should do so. But you did say that we will hear more um, as far as the full report is concerned in the fullness of time. Um, does that include the text messages that uh, the police are looking into? Well, it depends what... I mean, of course, both the police and Sue Gray need to look at the rules that apply to uh, the privacy and confidentiality of information that they receive. But look, if Sue Gray sends a further report Following the investigation, the PM has been very clear uh, it will be published. Including the 500 pages of information that the Met are looking into. Well, it, that depends what Sue Gray puts in her report. Including I mean, the emails that they've been they're looking into as well. well. The, the, it's not necessarily the case that they would, uh, or Sue Gray would publish that, but what I'm saying is whatever um, Sue Gray decides uh, in any follow-up report to publish, the Prime Minister has been very clear that, that he will. OK. And uh, if he's interviewed by the police, what does that say about the optics of the, uh, a sitting Prime Minister and his wife being well, interviewed by the police? Well, he hasn't been interviewed by, by, by police But the so police far. have said that they will inv interview people that were at these events, well, and uh, we know that the Prime Minister was at at least three of them. You're trying to jump ahead of no, the I'm investigation. Uh, I will Which allow bit of that's not true, well, look, I'm, I'm going to, as I said throughout, allow We know he was at at least three events, don't we? Yeah. And the police have said that they will investigate anybody or speak to anybody that was at those events. The sitting Prime Minister and his wife mm. being interviewed by the police. But that hasn't happened yet, uh, uh, um, Kate. I nearly called you I know you did. <laughs> I know you did. Um, but look, We're both the, formidable. The, the, it's true. Um, but look, the police will conduct that investigation. I'm not going to start commenting about uh, interviews that haven't taken but place. But the police have already commented. They've already said that they're going to investigate people that were at the parties. And, and, and we know and that the Prime so. Minister was at, at least three. Ergo, they're going to interview the Prime Minister. I think there's a lot hanging on your ergo. But the, the reality is the police will conduct that investigation. And look, you'll be able to ask all those questions if and when. But the, you said that after the Sue Gray report and, and still well, we, sat but, here. But actually, we published... When is it all going to end? Well, look, no one wants it to end uh, more swiftly than uh, I do or, or the government or the Prime Minister. But the reality is we follow... If we set up an independent process, you have to follow it. But what the Prime Minister has shown with the Sue Gray report, published in full, he took two hours of questions in the House of Commons, a further hour of questions uh, with the she parliamentary party. She acknowledged it wasn't published in full. She acknowledged that it, she was frustrated that it wasn't published in full and she doesn't trust the Prime Minister. She's not going to give it to him. She's keeping it under lock and key. Well... Uh, I'm not quite sure that those are the words that she used, uh, but the report that she gave him was published in full. And he's been clear any further report would be published. It, a little bit of, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister has done exactly what he said he would, exactly what he's been called to do, and he's respecting the independence of her and the Met Police. And, and, and I'm afraid you can't criticise him for that. Um, uh, if he was interfering either with the Sue Gray report or with the police investigation, you would be asking me a whole series of alternative questions. No, as I said, first no, Prime Minister though. said he didn't know, then it was a work event, then he was told... Uh, he wasn't told it was a party, then he was ambushed with cake, then he was told that we had to wait for Sue Gray, now we have to wait for the police. He knows whether he was at these parties or not, he said he wasn't at the parties, he's misled Parliament, he should step down. Don't accept the leaps in logic, um, what you're saying, but you're doing a very good job interrogating me on it. I would like 
to have the answers, but I'm afraid we have to wait for the police to conclude their investigations. And they've already started... I mean, it's gone from 12 to 8, I think, according to uh, what you cited there. They're whittling away at it. Hopefully, we'll get wait a response Wait for the police. Is wait for the new, for, it's the new wait for Sue Gray, isn't it? Well, the police are independent in this country. Could you imagine if actually I said I started commenting on what they would or wouldn't find? You'd be hauling me over the coals in a different way. Uh, are you surprised okay. that it was a civil servant that had to find out all this information rather than the police? Well, no, the, 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 the Prime Minister asked her to do it because he could see the seriousness of it. So, no, I'm not, not surprised. So you acknowledge That's... again that it, that it is a serious state of affairs. The problem is... Yeah, I do. And you're quite right. The problem is we're talking about this when actually the Prime Minister had to postpone and thus cancel a meeting with Putin yesterday. No, look, the, the call sheet for any Prime Minister with any Foreign Secretary, I know I did the job, uh, moves around all the time because you're balancing what you do in Parliament and your other but responsibilities. You didn't have 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine. The, the, and this, concerns this prime, about well, them in okay, Let me answer that. This Prime Minister is the one who has been leading uh, the transatlantic response with the United States, with uh, our European uh, allies, with the most robust approach on sanctions, uh, providing support. He's going out to Ukraine to see President of Ukraine uh, with the Foreign Secretary today. And we're the ones holding that line, uh, galvanising the, the support. making the most of it, isn't he, while we're waiting for our Prime Minister to deal with it? Sorry, to, 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 I'm, to deal with okay, the situation in Ukraine. Okay, okay, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, and now I'm moving Ukraine, on. And, and in relation to Ukraine, actually, this Prime Minister showed, notwithstanding everything that's been going on, and it's significant, he's been getting on with the job on sanctions, making sure it's very clear there'll be a cost to Putin if he continues with this bellicose behaviour and invades Ukraine. And yet it's taken it so seriously, he still had to cancel a meeting yesterday, a phone call yesterday with Putin, because he had to answer these allegations in the House. Well, it, it, look, uh, the, the, any prime minister, any president, it happens all the time. Their diaries and their call sheets uh, dart around the place because they're balancing things. Um, but look, you know, frankly, uh, the the, uh, the prime minister has been the one being very clear, firming up our European allies, uh, bridging with our other NATO allies, making sure that we've got robust sanctions. Uh, and a mechanism for applying an economic cost, and also making sure we're supporting not just Ukraine, but the other NATO allies, particularly in the Baltics and Central and Eastern Europe, who are very nervous now about their position vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia. And yet still the Prime Minister couldn't have a conversation with President Putin yesterday because he had to talk about the, Sue Gray in the, the House of Commons. Right, look, um, of course, there are always scheduling issues between any two heads of government. OK. Um, it's always um, interesting to tussle with a lawyer. Thank you very much thank you. for joining us, as always, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. Do you fancy the job? If he's, if it's... No, I'm fully supportive of this Prime Minister. He will go on, he'll win the next election. I'm very confident in that. OK, we will, of course, clip that up. Thanks very much indeed, Prime Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. I nearly called you Prime Minister then. Uh, let's have a look at the papers. A failure of leadership, says the Metro, quoting the report. They say Boris Johnson's premiership has plunged to a new low. The Guardian says that Tory backbenchers have turned on their leader over their 12 gatherings being investigated by the Metropolitan Police. The Express is headline, Yes, PM, you've got it wrong. Now get it right, after what they describe as a bruising day. And the Prime Minister has zero shame in the words, excuse me, of the Daily Mirror. Someone who knows an awful lot about the workings of government and parliament is Jack Straw. He's with us now. Hello to you, Mr Straw. Thank you for joining us. Just heard the Deputy Prime Minister. What did you make of it? Well, Dominic Raab uh, was making uh, the best he could uh, of an impossible wicket. Uh, and I mean, I, I was also Foreign Secretary, not for two years, but for five years. Um, and I, I don't recall uh, more than just a couple of occasions for really good reasons, like serious illness, when Tony Blair did not complete the calls to uh, appropriate head of government, or in my case, I didn't complete the call to uh, the appropriate uh, foreign minister. What this, it's much worse than a scandal. It's kind of rot in the heart of the, of the government is doing is also sucking the life out of the government. And this is extraordinarily diversionary of all the kind of work that should be being done within government. Um, and I know that uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is going to the Ukraine today with Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary. And we heard uh, Dominic there saying, oh, well, you know, he's been in the lead on um, trying to sort out uh, the Ukraine. Um, 
that across the world, as you will know from uh, the researches your people will have done on foreign press, uh, the United Kingdom is a laughing stock, and Johnson is not taken seriously at all. Yes, he's agreeing with the United States, uh, but why has Germany taken a completely different approach to the Ukraine? Why isn't President Macron uh, taking a, a, a different view? It's for, partly for their own internal politics, but in the old days, a British prime minister would have had a very good fist at leading the rest of the uh, of Europe, certainly, uh, and pushing the United States president along. And that hasn't happened at all. They take no notice of him. I'm intrigued to know your take on one of the points I was discussing with the Deputy Prime Minister, former Foreign Secretary, um, just like you. And um, I'd made the point that there should have been a phone call yesterday between Boris Johnson and Putin. He said that these schedules are moved all the time uh, and it's absolutely nothing to read into that. Just because he was in the chamber talking about Sue Gray, you know, it can happen another time. Is that a reasonable response? Well, um, they're not moved all the time like this. I mean, this was a big deal. It was a particularly big deal for Boris Johnson to have his press people announce uh, that uh, he, Johnson, was talking not just to a head of government, but to a head of state in, in uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, it shows further evidence, if you like, of, of sort of uh, congenital systemic chaos in Downing Street. I mean, didn't somebody think about the fact that if they were going to have a call uh, with uh, Putin, it might be a good idea not to schedule it at the time of Sue Gray's report? Since Moscow is three or four hours, depending on time of year, ahead uh, of London, why didn't they have it in the morning um, before Sue Gray's report was received? Um, or, and just say, we're terribly sorry, just as you, they, you Mr. Putin, can't make it um, say in, in, in your hours of darkness, which are different from ours. Um, we can't make it for reasons we don't need to disclose um, on uh, Monday afternoon and uh, Monday evening. Um, so it, it is, say, aside from the humiliation that he hasn't been able to, uh, do his job as prime minister, which is on, on foreign policy, talk to heads of government. Uh, it's just the reflection of somebody just not having a, th you know, not not getting the idea uh, that there could be a problem, uh, and uh, and <laughs> the, the two two things won't work. You can't be in the House of Commons and taking a call from Vladimir Putin. Uh, sorry. Um, how worried should we be? about what's happening on the border with Ukraine? We should be pretty worried. I mean, it's very difficult to say whether um, this will situation will result in a Russian invasion, because I think Russia realises that the price of that in non-military terms, and maybe in military terms, is going to be very intense. And um, it had the experience, I mean, let me say, as, as the UK and the US and others did as well, of getting bogged down in Afghanistan. <clears throat> that was for 10 years. Excuse me. Um, and will it want to get bogged down again? So I, th but uh, I, I mean, I think I'm more optimistic than I was. And, and indeed, as each day passes, I think the prospect of a Russian invasion will diminish, but it's still there. And it depends on keeping the pressure up and showing the Ukrainians that we uh, that we are supporting them. OK, um, what's your advice to Liz Truss? She's got COVID at the moment, so she can't head over to Ukraine with the uh, prime minister. She can't go to Moscow. What sort of diplomacy can you carry out from behind your desk? Um, oh, you can do quite a lot, uh, particularly I mean, the crucial thing about um, phone calls and these days Zoom calls, Zoom and, and uh, team calls uh, in diplomacy, is you need to have built up the relationships first. Uh, I mean, it's not that much different from normal human relations. So if she's got a good relations with uh, other foreign ministers, um, then she'll be able to make the calls. And sometimes you have to make the calls and you've never met the people in, in your life. Um, but... I mean, I think Liz should spend more time thinking about the Ukraine and rather less time thinking about 
the next post she puts on Instagram uh, as part of her putative leadership bid, uh, which I think for her, uh, I say to it, so to say to her, someone in Europe quite well, uh, as uh, as well as the country, is a mistake. She says uh, that the Prime Minister has her wholehearted support and she has no interest in being Prime Minister. I know, people always say that. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's some... Uh, and, and, I mean, the truth is that Boris Johnson will have Liz Truss's wholehearted support until Boris Johnson is not there. Um, and... Um, well, who knows, in the secrecy of the ballot of the Conservative Parliamentary Party, if there is a ballot, how Liz Truss or Dominic Raab uh, will vote. But I'd have, if I, I, mean, I watched Dominic Raab you know, face your very difficult questions and give the, in a sense, the best non-answers he could think of. But what the government's having to think about is that this is going to go on and on and on. And every time anything happens, whatever the subject is, the issue will be understandably shifting and shifted by the journalists or by opposition MPs onto the Prime Minister's behaviour. I mean, I do not really, I can't think uh, of uh, any other occasion in, in my lifetime um, when a Prime Minister has faced this level of destabilization of his own choosing. So, and so whatever uh, Boris John, uh, sorry, Dominic Raab or Liz Truss say about the fact that they will give their prime minister full support, well, they do for the time being, they will get more and more fed up with this. And it's not, in my view, going to go away. Um. It is to, down to the uh, backbenchers and it is, um, you know, his other Conservative colleagues as well, isn't it? Because Labour does not have a big enough uh, majority, even uh, with other flavours of politics as well from the House of Commons. And so yeah. it's up to the Conservatives uh, to decide whether he stays in power or not. And it certainly looks as though for now he still has their backing. What does that say about the Conservatives um, to that side of the House? Well, the, I, I mean, I think there are some, I mean, I know there are very, very many perfectly decent Conservatives. Uh, we, we saw examples of those in Theresa May and Andrew Mitchell yesterday, who are absolutely appalled by this. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not, you know, we, we have lots of difficulties in government, you do, including Afghanistan and above all, Iraq, but I, we've ne never had, and I've never saw it on the other side, you didn't see it with Margaret Thatcher or John Major um, or David Cameron, um, this kind of personal uh, failure of character, which is eating away at the government. Um, but, um, so I do apologise, I was taken by my own phrases and forgot your question. You know what, that's happened to me twice in two days now by former <laughs> uh, foreign secretaries for the Labour Party. I, and I thought I was doing quite well. I was basically asking about the moral fibre of Conservatives on that side okay. of the well, House who don't it? want to get rid of the leader. What does it say about them? Well, they'll have to make their own minds up about this, about where their interests lie. Um, the crucial thing everybody has to think about in the House of Commons, above all else, is staying there. How do you stay there? I, that means how do you get re-elected? Uh, and you can't take any seat for granted. I mean, we found that uh, at, uh, last, at last, the last election in December 2019, um, when uh, we lost catastrophically a number of seats, which frankly, the Labour Party, and particularly awful, egregious Jeremy Corbyn, are taken for granted. Um, and the Conservatives will find the same. I mean, back in 1997, um, we won uh, most of the seats in Essex. It's my home county. I know it very well. Um, and they just, the Conservative seats went down like flies. And so, and, and bear in mind that since the Conservatives have uh, only a handful of seats, like as we do, in Scotland, they're, and, and uh, they're in a minority in Wales. They're very, very dependent for their majority on what happens in English seats. And in, in, in a lot of the so-called red wall seats, we already know that there is fury about the way in which uh, Boris Johnson has taken uh, the British public and the voters in those areas for fools. So I think a few more weekends 
where uh, members of parliament, particularly new ones who've given Mr Johnson his majority, are getting their heads scrubbed uh, by their voters, may see a shift. If it doesn't, um, it will just tell me that the Conservatives have lost the will to survive. And I don't, I don't actually think that's true. So why are Labour flailing at the polls again? Failing at the polls? I, I probably missed something this morning. Uh, yeah, so the latest polls are suggesting that the lead that uh, Labour had has been cut in half. In other words, I suppose the other way of looking at that is that uh, um, people are either deciding that they prefer Boris Johnson um, to Keir Starmer or they're bored with the Sue Gray story. Well, we're still ahead in the polls. I mean, it would be, it would be a pretty surprising if, if we weren't. Um, they will bob up and down. I know one says that when, when uh, you, you're below... Uh, the, the other side in the, in the polls. I personally uh, think that Keir Starmer has done well and the public have been able to see uh, this man for the, the man of values uh, that he is uh, and compare and contrast him uh, with uh, Mr Johnson. And I, we, we, there'll be a by-election uh, on Thursday, uh, but that's to do with the, the murder of Sir David Amos and I don't think we'll get anything about of that, not least because... The, the main parties aren't standing there. Um, but I'm pretty optimistic about the results of the May elections. And if you want, we can have a side bet on that. And I'll have to come on the following week and eat humble pie. <laughs> what do you make of what Ian Blackford got up to yesterday? Rules is rules. You know, you can't expect the Prime Minister to abide by rules and then the leader of the SNP oh, right. I mean, to not I mean, do. Mr Blackford is a kind of pantomime character, really. Um, oh, no, he isn't. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> but did he do the right thing? You know, he would say he's a man of conviction. Yeah, you can make a conviction point without having to break the rules. That's my view. I'm afraid I'm, I haven't got a great deal of time for the Scottish National Party, uh, National, Nationalist Party. I mean, they are all things to all people, provided they're complaining uh, and pitching themselves uh, against the English and taking more money uh, from English taxpayers uh, than English taxpayers get for themselves, and then complaining some more. Um, and one day, although it has been a very long time coming, and there's been a Labour failure in Scotland, um, the SNP support will twist and, and fall. OK. Good to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for joining us again, Jack Straw. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Boris Johnson promised to fix the way Downing Street operates after Sue Gray's a report found a serious failure in party leadership, but tensions rose as the PM repeatedly dodged questions about Partygate. Uh, his best course is simply to wait for the, uh, for the inquiry to be completed. I urge him to, to reconsider upon full consideration of the, of the inquiry. We should wait for the outcome of the inquiry by, before jumping to the conclusions uh, that he has. I propose that we wait until the conclusion of the, of the inquiry. I must really ask him to look at the uh, report properly and also to wait uh, for the inquiry when it comes. I would simply urge him to wait for the outcome of the, of the inquiry. That's what he needs to do. It is now time for the police to consider the relevant material. And that is what the House should allow them, frankly, to do. Former senior police officer has accused Cressida Dick of launching a nonsense inquiry into Partygate over minor offences. Di Davis and some Conservative MPs say the investigation was a deplorable waste of public money given the scale of crime and violent attacks in London. And the former chief of Scotland Yard's Royal Protection Command, Di Davis, joining us. Now, hello to you. Thank you so much for joining us on the programme this morning. Um, What's your view as far as this investigation is uh, concerned, the amount of evidence that the Met is going to have to go through? Well, good morning to you. Uh, in the court of public opinion, I think they've been found guilty OK uh, already, the Prime Minister, that is, and some of his senior colleagues. It now remains to see, out of this quagmire, a mess, what the police will do. And what concerns me is the fact is that no matter what evidence has already been presented, that was obtained by a civil servant, not a police officer. And I wonder how much of that can be induced in evidence if this was a proper criminal inquiry. But of course it isn't. 
it is uh, the equivalent of investigating uh, parking in one sense on yellow lines. But of course, it's far more than that. And what may come out if people tell little lies, big lies often follow. Look at Prince Andrew, look at Mr. Bashir. All manner of people start off with relatively small uh, lies and then they get found out. So I wonder what on earth will now happen uh, to this investigation, but uh, it is a mess by any definition. You described it as nonsense. Do you still stand by that? Well, nonsense in the sense that it uh, started at this stage. I would have thought if Miss Gray had relevant information which took it into criminal investigation, perhaps that should have been done much earlier before any of these 400 people who allegedly work at uh, uh, number 10 actually were interviewed. I understand 70 have, but again, they were interviewed, as I understand it, under civil service rules, which are quite different to the police investigating you. So how much of that so-called information, 500 photos and all the rest of it, could be induced in evidence if the police are going to make a factual report. I think they left it far, far too late, in my humble opinion. OK, good to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us on the programme this morning, Mr Davies, with your expert uh, guidance. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Sakir Starmer's here. Um, your thoughts after yesterday? Well, uh, we only had part of the story from Sue Gray, obviously, but it was a pretty damning part of the story. We know that of the 12 parties or gatherings that she was investigating, uh, of the 16 she was investigating, 12 of them are going to the police for investigation because the police have assessed that they're serious enough and flagrant enough to put on one side the usual rule that they won't look at things more than 12 months ago. So it's as damning as it could be. And, you know, we're all paying the price for the chaos and incompetence and worse of the Prime Minister and his behaviour. And now we need to wait for the police report. We've got to wait for the police to investigate. So we've got a Prime Minister who I think broke the rules, I think then lied about breaking the rules, who then instigated the Sue Gray report and has now brought a criminal investigation upon himself. Um, and that is about as damning as it can get for a British Prime Minister of whatever political party. Meanwhile, meanwhile, people are seeing their energy bills go up and nothing is being done about it. And so, you know, there was a real range of emotions yesterday in the House because I think the one thing that the last six, seven weeks uh, of allegations about the Prime Minister's behaviour have done is forced everybody to relive moments in their own lives in the last two years, those sort of dark moments, and people have felt angry, they felt grief, and, and they felt guilt. And I've had so many people say to me, Keir, I feel guilty because I followed the rules, I didn't do what I wanted to do in my heart, go and look after my dad, clean up, look after an elderly relative, and I've, I feel guilty that I didn't do it because I was obeying the rules, and people feel that they've been taken for mugs. There's now a further emotion, which is frustration, which is my energy bills are going up and the government's doing absolutely nothing about it. Now, we, the Labour Party, have said we'll cut those energy bills. We've set out how we would fund that with a windfall tax on oil and gas. Um, we want the government to get on with it. We've got a motion this afternoon in Parliament to be voted on. Um, but the Prime Minister is spending all of his time saving his own skin instead of running the country. Isn't he a lawyer? I mean, given that you are a lawyer, he certainly isn't. Um, isn't he innocent until proven guilty? Well, of course he is, but... Um, Why are we judging him? <laughs> we got to an absurd situation yesterday where he was asked a very simple question. Were you at the party in your own flat on the 30th of November 2020? And he says, I can't answer that because there's police investigation. That is nonsense. But wouldn't that prejudice uh, the police investigation? How does it prejudice the police investigation for him to admit that he was at a party in his own flat? I'm sorry, that is bordering on the ridiculous. Because he could have he gone to the it. flat, he lives there, he could be in one of the bedrooms, there could be something going on elsewhere and he wouldn't even know about it. You know, a bit like when he went into the garden, he didn't know that that was a gathering. And when <laughs> he knew, then he left and he didn't know... He was totally ambushed by the cake. He didn't know that that was going to be a birthday party. Yeah, yeah, apparently he went into the garden and there were bottles of wine and trellises of, uh, of, of sandwiches and lots of people drinking. And he didn't realise 
it was a party he until was he was 25. Pressure. He was trying to run the country at the time we were in the middle of a pandemic. Do you know, one of the things that has angered people most over the last few weeks is, one, they know he broke the rules. Two, they think he's insulting their intelligence with these ridiculous defences. And he's also forcing all of his front bench, his ministers out, onto your programmes and others, um, to make complete fools of themselves, peddling these absurd defences. Isn't that up to them? Well, it is up to them, but meanwhile, we've got an energy bill crisis which isn't being addressed. And that is why we've had a proposal on the table to reduce energy bills for um, several weeks now, and the government is doing absolutely nothing about it. And whilst they're trying to save his skin, he was supposed to have a meeting with the Chancellor last week about energy bills. It got cancelled because he needed to spend his time with his own backbenchers saving his own job. Families, therefore, are not getting a reduction on their energy bill. And Labour has stepped up to say, we've got a plan, we've got a costed plan, we want to move it forward. Whilst you are mired in this misbehaviour, we are, we are putting the case for a new Britain built on security, prosperity and respect, and we will continue to make that case. And I invite all Tory MPs this afternoon, if they really want to move this on and focus on energy bills, vote with us this afternoon to reduce the bills for millions of families across the country. Yeah, well, as you know, uh, if, if I had a Conservative uh, MP sitting there, they'd be telling me about the vaccine rollout, they'd be telling me about how well the economy is doing, they'd be telling me about how well the furlough scheme went. So, you know, let's, let's put that to one side, if we may, and talk about specifically about what people are concerned about, which is the Sue Gray report, yeah. and whether that is in enough for the Prime Minister to step down. The Prime Minister says, no, it's not. It does look as though his backbenchers are agreeing with him. When you looked over at them yesterday in the House of Commons, how did you feel? I looked at their face. The one thing, there aren't many advantages of being the dispatch box, but as you step forward to the dispatch box, all the sort of friendly faces are behind you and you've got a wall of, uh, uh, of the government faces. Their faces were stony. They were not with him. They know how serious this is. Um, and, and I think that they're ashamed of the Prime Minister. And you can, you can see very well when they're with him and when they're not with him. And you heard some of what those on his own side said yesterday about his behaviour. They know that, you know, successive prime ministers, whether they're, you know, Conservative, whether they're Labour, have honoured the office. They've recognised that to lead this country is an honour. It's not a birthright. And, and, and I think they're ashamed of this prime minister. OK, this was, this was the scene um, yesterday. He did have um, some uh, support. Some of them stood up um, to speak um, in his support and there was a lot of nodding from the um, front bench, as, as you said. I mean, what would you say to the front bench of the government this morning? They know that this, can't, this Prime Minister cannot be removed unless they act. Um, I think he's unfit for office and I think they should act and remove this Prime Minister who is not fit for his responsibilities. Um, and they've got a choice. They either do that or they carry on debasing themselves and going out into the studios peddling his absurd defences. They have to go out and make the argument that their Prime Minister didn't realise he was at a party with bottles and sandwiches for half an hour. They have to come and sit on your show and make that argument. They know it's not true. They know it's cr not credible. I think they are debasing themselves and debasing their office. They are also not getting on with the job because they're spending the whole of their time defending a Prime Minister who is indefensible. OK, you talked about wine and sandwiches. We need to deal with this photograph as well of you with beer and bottles back in Durham. I think it was April of 2020. Um, if, you, if you were Sue Gray, would you want to investigate that? I've explained this um, photograph, which actually came out a couple of days after it was taken so many times. We were in a constituency office working. It was a few days before the local elections. Um, and we had nothing to eat, a takeaway came and we ate, we stopped to eat the takeaway and then we went back to work. That is the long and the short of it. There is no breach of the rules, there was no party, there's nothing to investigate. And you'd be happy for the police to look into that in more detail? Well, look, the police are now looking at 12 of the 16 allegations, having assessed them to be serious. There is no breach of the rule there. No, it's we, been... You, so you would be happy for the police to look into it? Absolutely nothing to hide at all. I've explained it so many times. Even the Prime Minister has now backed off attacking So you would be happy for the police to look into it? No problem. There was no breach of the rules. OK. I didn't understand what the Prime Minister was talking about yesterday when he brought up Jimmy Savile. What's all that about? It is a ridiculous slur peddled by right-wing trolls. And, um... The disgust, and this is where I saw the faces of the Conservative MPs, the disgust on their faces that their Prime Minister 
was debasing himself by sinking so low in the chamber was clear. You know, they knew that he was going so low with that slur, with that lie. Um, he'd been advised not to do it because it's obviously not true, but he does it because he doesn't understand what honesty and integrity means. So when I was director of public prosecutions, on, so I, I was superintended the, by the attorney general, a conservative a attorney general. So it is as ridiculous as it gets. And, and, and I'm glad that those Tories MPs were disgusted. And many of them expressed that to me, disgusted at their prime minister for debasing himself in the House of Commons instead of acting with the contrition and the integrity that he should have shown yesterday. He does what he always does, which is to try to drag everybody into the gutter with him. And the one thing we know about this prime minister is everybody who's ever come into contact with him always gets damaged in the process. I've been working in politics for uh, a very long time. First election I ever covered was 1979, when Margaret Thatcher won. Um, and I am used to politicians not liking each other particularly, but they always use a language of diplomacy. You, you, you've, you've decided to put that away now. I, I'm not one of these politicians that is so tribal that I won't reach out and form partnerships, even friendships, with Conservative MPs. Many of them I know, I like and I get along with and I think that is my reputation in Parliament. But when I see a Prime Minister lacking the basic honesty and integrity uh, for the job of Prime Minister, then I'm sorry, that's a step too far for me, whatever the colour, whatever the party of that Prime Minister. And does it make you think, you know, I don't want to be involved in politics anymore. If we've got this guy in charge, it's not for me. No, it makes me even more determined that we must make sure this Prime Minister is gone. He's debasing the officer of, uh, office of Prime Minister. He's just got to go. OK. Um, do you think that he should uh, face face-to-face -face in, um, inquiries from the police? Oh, well, I mean, it's up to the police now how they conduct their investigations. Um, and they may well need to uh, interview him. That's a matter for them, and I don't think I should be telling them how to do their job in that respect. OK, how long do you think it's going to take? I hope not long. It's a very simple offence. Uh, how many people were there? Was there a reasonable excuse? So it's, it's a not lot a... of evidence, though. There's 500 pages and 300 photographs. It's a lot of photographs for a work event, but there we are. There are a lot of photographs, and um, often a picture tells a thousand uh, words, so a picture tells a thousand words. So, you know, we'll see what they say. OK. Let me just ask you before you go. Um, it was a very challenging time for a lot of people, the pandemic. For you in particular, I mean, you, you found it very difficult as far as the family was concerned, didn't you? I did, or we did, um, and, um, you know, my wife lost her mum just before the pandemic and it was a very, very difficult time for her. Um, and we as a family had our struggles um, and she had her struggles. I prefer not to go into them in great detail because I always try to protect the privacy of my family. Um, but one of the reasons that I said yesterday that every family was marked by this is because we as a family were marked by it, what we didn't do because we followed the rules and the grief that that brought and, and, and the guilt that that brought upon us. And, and do you regret abiding by the rules now, given what you know was potentially happening at Downing Street? I think millions of people feel that they, they were mugs. P -p -p people tossed and turned at night, thinking, I should have done that for my family member. I should have gone in and cleaned up. I should have hugged. I should have done something in the situation. But they didn't, because they were following the rules. Um, and certainly there are elements of that in my own family. I think every family had elements of that. And now they do look back and feel, you know, that they were mugs. Do you they feel shouldn't. You were a mug? They sh no, they shouldn't. They should feel pride. Pride that what they did probably saved the lives of people they will never meet. And that is the real story of our country through this pandemic. And um, the great tragedy now is it's stained by this Prime Minister and by his behaviour. So, Kira, I must let you go. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you.